Okay, there we are. Big sweep in over the feature match area. Ben Stark on your left. Brian Kibler oh, on your right. We are in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. It is 7.13 p.m. local time. Yep. Hope you're watching us around the world. This is going to shape up to be a match of titans. And it looks like uh, Kibler started with an Aether Vial, which is pretty important for, uh, for his deck, since uh, being able to cheat creatures into play is, is a huge edge for him. Now, of course, for those of you not quite up on magic lingo, cheating something into play isn't actually cheating <laughs> it into play. We're not talking about cheaty face here, no. <laughs> uh, he, but he can get around, and he draws a second Aether Vial. He can get around counter spells. Sure. Because Aether Vial is an activated ability, you're not actually casting the spell. Well, and you don't have to pay mana for the creature. So in a, in a couple turns, not only is he going to be immune to all Ben's counter spells, of which Ben does have many, he's going to be ben, able to just have, put a bunch uh, of creatures into play without out. paying for them, maybe even activate Stirring Wildwood instead, which is a, a lot of additional value. Okay, okay Ben's going to draw a card, play Steam Ben's say go. Yeah, Ben cast Think Twice main phase there, Sorry, and then played a land, time. which uh, definitely indicates he was not going to play a land yeah, otherwise. Right. So Kibler has to know that, and give, having information that K Ben is short on lands is, is valuable. Okay, Arid Mesa comes down, so a nice peel there for Ben Stark. We see a Cryptic Command in his hand. Yeah. So he, there's there's value to Brian to have two Ether Vials on different numbers. Yeah, it means that he can just keep them at like two and three and just put all his creatures into play if he'd like. Or you can just double up on two. He's got a lot of options in that in that regard. It's also kind of interesting that Ben didn't crack his uh, fetch lands like his Arid Mesa or Scalding Tarn, and he actually might be vulnerable here to Avid Mind Sensor, which Brian does have in his hand, since uh, Avid Mind Sensor does a pretty good job of stopping uh, fetch lands. It means Ben has to find the land in the top four instead of uh, looking through the whole deck. So what is like the if it's discarded in a play ability, which Correct. is relevant, and then all the other abilities are only just the plus one plus one to greens, plus one plus one yeah. to whites, and it's a four four. Mm -hmm. There we hear Ben start getting stop, clarification obviously. on Wilt Leaf Liege. Yeah, so we've got Wilt Leaf Liege as, as kind of the heavy hitter in Brian's deck here. Here you see it up on the screen. All your other green creatures get plus one, plus one. All your white creatures get plus one, plus one. And then the last ability that uh, Ben was asking about, if an opponent makes you discard it, you get to put it into play. Yeah, which uh, doesn't really apply here. And now they're playing a game of cat and mouse where Kibler doesn't want to put Avid Mind Sensor into play, and Ben doesn't want to crack his fetch lines. So I don't know how much they're both thinking about it, but it's definitely happening. <laughs> All right, uh, Kibler activates Stirring Wildwood and gets in. And one of the advantages of Aether Vial there. I'm take one. Okay, so Ben cracks his Arid Mesa. Brian asks him, hang on for a second. Yeah, now I think it's a uh, Mind Sensor time. Okay, there's Mind Sensor. Of course, Ben but can then... Yeah, technically this is a little slightly out of order. That. Right. Is that, is that uh, Kibler just tap while put Mind Sensor into play, but... Uh, <laughs> it looks like... Hold on. Well, you, what do you... you if you're, yeah. I'm yeah. activating this, so like, once oh. I put it into play, you, act, you can't actually respond to the ability. Yeah. So, right, That's uh, here's here's the thing. So Putting yeah, into play I is guess. the resolution of the ether vial. I right. Uh, we should yeah. probably so it's not clear whether yeah. Yeah. Judge. Ben passed after <laughs> Kibler tapped the vial for three, because so, Kibler kind of put the mind right. sensor into play. I activate ether vial. I put the, uh, he, he activated this. I activate ether vial, put this into play. And, I and he, he, he said, in response, I'll do this. Once this is in play, he can't actually respond. He can't actually respond to this entering play and use that without the, the, the actual mind that they're being deployed. You activate the vial? I activated the vial. And asked him for a response? Uh, I, I didn't specifically say... He, he, said, he didn't ask for a response, and it, but he played at like a normal pace. Like he didn't yeah, like I didn't, snap, I didn't, I didn't, like, snap throw it in play, play, but he didn't ask for a response or anything. He just, okay, so you want okay, to so activate. level five Judge Ricardo uh, yes. Testatori right there on your screen, trying to make some sense out of this. And it looks like Ben wasn't unhappy with how okay, fast Kibber put, put that mind sensor into play, so... Then I will respond with... Okay, so it looks like... So, uh, Ben's cracking so the fetch land with Vile for uh, three trigger on the stack. Untapped. In response, uh, yeah, Kibler's so tapping Vile for two. That's happen. resolving, that, and that one's Arbiter's happen. coming these into play. Two are right. um, well, these are these are both. Let's just create the stack because I'm yeah, really this, confused. This being stacked. Yeah. And, and then, then this, then this vial, vial activation. Yeah. 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 I know this is not on either of our specialties. So and now this is and now this is in play. And then this is successfully in play. Right. And now I have my options with like. Right. So I'm at 17 because I paid the one when I activated them, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's in, that's in play. You've got three cards in hand. Four. Uh, four cards. Okay. All right. And let the players explain it to you. Like 
kill that or pay the two. Yeah. Or and we we see that they've gotten it worked out. Again, the the creature coming to play off of Ether Mile is the resolution. Yeah, so not, it's not like casting the spell that you would choose the spell yeah. that you were going to cast. So imagine the tap David file is an Avid Mind Sensor on the stack. <laughs> that, that's, right. that's kind of what's happening there. Uh, just with one fetch already being cracked, Aaron Mesa, and then yeah, now I'll the Tarn being cracked. Too, so. This can happen. so Ben is going to be able to search his whole library uh, off of, off the, of the, scalding tarn. the Scalding Tarn. I'll go get an untapped colored fountain. And then he's... Uh, so I'm going to go to 15. He's going to then have the to. Either vial for three can resolve now. If there's like the mind sensor. The creature in play. Sure. There's the mind sensor. So Ben's going to have to find a land out of his top again. four. Yeah, yeah. I'm which is all you can search. Path that. Sure. Oh no, he's going to path the mind sensor so that he and can then, search uh, Arid Mason again. Yeah. Right. And so he paths the mind sensor and then uh, he goes ahead yeah. and. Uh, Gets to because get, he already paid the two to the Leon Arbiter, which lasts for the entire turn. I mean, I would have done yeah, it. Yeah, no, like, I know, but yeah. I mean, like you're, you're tapping activated a uh, vial for three, like mind sensors the assumption. Right, you know? right, but it was partly my mistake as well. Yeah, for sure. Right. And then now because the Arbiter is an equal opportunity tax man, uh, n n does not actually allow Kibler to search off the path tax up. So great catch from our and I do take the three from floor, the floor reporter. So I finish up Rashad the Miller. Definitely. Um, so now. After all that confusing stuff happens, <laughs> Storm Wildwood does get to punch Ben in the face for three. Uh, I have three cards. Okay. And you're done? Yep. Now, ben, Ben's got to be careful about taking damage from these Shocklands. I mean, Kip, Kibler has a reasonably aggressive deck, right? Yeah. I, Kibler is, is a beatdown deck. It's not the fastest. It's more of a disruptive, like, beatdown deck. But it is a beatdown deck. And if Ben takes two damage off every land he plays, or three if it's Perfect. a fetch land, then he could end up in a, in, in a place where his life total is, is too low to really uh, deal with all of Kibler's threats. Right. He's going to kill the Arbor there. Yeah, using a Pyroclasm here. And so Kibler has his vials, so again, he doesn't have to tap it, uh, mana for anything. Remember, Brian Brian can choose to not tick up the Ether Vial. He can leave him at 2 and 3. Yeah, if he, if he wants to leave, leave it at uh, 2 and 3. He does have uh, Wilt Leaf Liege, but he might not be worried about uh, a counter spell here. There's a Noble Hierarch, which is important because it has Exalted. It's going to give that Stirring Wildwood an extra plus oh. one, plus one if it attacks a lot. So in hand, he hasn't drawn a Wilt Leaf Liege yet, but he does have Scavenging Ooze in hand. And Scavenging Ooze is actually another combo with the other vial. It seems like it never ends, just because uh, you can vial it in and then just use it a bunch of times instead of having to pay for creatures. Uh, Aether Vial, of course, has a has a Go ahead. history here <laughs> in our in our 16-player tournament last year, Shout out. Shota Yasuoka making great use of them in his deck that just pretty much wrecked the like field until the finals. Yeah, one of the really cool plays in his deck is tap Aether Vial for four, put a Huntmaster of the Fells um, into play, pass the turn, have it slip immediately, because yeah. <laughs> he hadn't played a spell. <laughs> so I, I like that, actually. So Ben, content to do nothing with a pair of Cryptics, an Electrolyze, and a Snapcaster Mage in hand, which is uh, kind of kind of what you're looking for there. Or perhaps a trio of cryptics, okay. even. <laughs> Looks like all three. Okay, there's the Stirring Wildwood. Snapcaster Mage. Gonna path that. Yeah, that looks like his plan. You could give Fink twice a flashback to save a mana, <laughs> but I, I, I think Ben's probably not, not looking to do that. Okay, let's see what Brian Kibler has. Oh, he's got a cool play here. He gets to have Violin Scavenging Ooze. <laughs> sure. Uh, I will remove that. So he gets to scavenging goose gets to devour the path. No counter, but it does actually stop the snapcaster oh, from right, flashing the effect. Goes on the stack right, the ability is on the stack. Right. Yeah, targeting it. Um, right. Once again, the players getting clarification from each other exactly where they are in the stack sequence. <laughs> yeah, there are uh, confusing things happening in this match, but they've been able to figure it out quite well, which is not much of a surprise. Yeah, um, for those of you watching along at home, remember these are two Hall of Fame players. I wouldn't um, necessarily suggest playing at the breakneck speed that these guys yeah, are playing. Yeah, both these guys play quite quickly, and uh, y y things could get confusing. So Ben has a couple options here. He can electrolyze. He can't um, kill the Scavenging Ooze because it could eat the Leonin Arbiter, but he could also, you know, flashback Think twice. Like, at this point, he's not going to get to cast the path no matter what. Yeah, can't do anything about that. All right, you, we hear from the back tables that um, Yuyu Nabi has taken game one from Stanislav Sivka, and Reed Duke has taken game one from Shahar Shinhar. And that matchup in particular, Shahar against Reed Duke, it really depends on if Shahar has good sideboard cards against Hexproof, which he might, he might not. 
He seemed concerned about it earlier. Well, as Rich and Brian Keep were talking left. about earlier, that uh, he really, Shahar really feels that he's a heavy underdog right, in that oh, match. Good Okay, there's Ben Stark's hand, Electrolyze, and three times Cryptic Command. And he, he got bashed for four by the stalking uh, Stern Wildwood right because off. of Noble Hierarch. Yeah. I, I don't believe I have. I don't think this is either of our kind of magic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe I have. So, Kibler verifying whether or not he's played a land this turn. Uh, and I believe the answer to that is no. Yeah. I think he played the thicket last turn. Well, I certainly didn't play thicket this turn because I, yeah. I added yeah. there. So. I think he played the thicket last turn. He's right in the thicket of things here, but uh, the question now is he's got uh, Temple Garden. He's playing it untapped so he can use Scavenging Use twice and potentially use uh, the Path to Exile on his hand. Go ahead. Think twice. Yep. Can't stop Think Twice from getting flashback, though, since uh, Ben can always just you know, flash it back in response. All right. Does, uh, does B-Stark have any uh, Tectonic Edges in uh, his... Ben is playing... Three tectonic edges, yes. So he's got a little bit of disruption for the stirring wildwood here. He's got also a hand of cryptic commands. Even though Ben's at eight, I, he's not that close to dying. Uh, eight life is actually a lot when you have a bunch of cryptic commands in your hand. Yeah, and only one card in hand for Brian Kibler. So despite not paying mana for anything with Ether Vial, he still only has one card. Yeah, I mean Ether Vial does cost you a card. It is it, so it's kind of like he has seven lands in play, which is a lot for a deck like his. Scavenging is eating the pyroclasm, but leaving the Leonin Arbiter around, I think uh, Brian is worried about uh, an Electrolyze, which it turns out Ben does have in his hand. Draw. Right, there's Kibler's draw. As he madly flicks his cards as he doesn't want to do. It looks like a Luxon Smiter, though, which is pretty good here. It's, it gets around Lightning Bolt and Electrolyze, and uh, Vial does mean Cryptic Command is a little less good than it would be, though Cryptic Command is still an amazing card. Uh, All right. Looks like we're preparing to go on, on, on the offensive here. So well, it doesn't have flash, right? Okay. That, would be, that would be sick. <laughs> that would be uh, absolutely unreal. Probably should have. Great rapport fast. between these two these two players who are playing for the third time this weekend. Right, right. Yeah, they they actually have have played three times now. And a possibility on a fourth, especially <laughs> if Kibler wins the match. And Ben Stark's up 2-0 so far. <laughs> after after coming in, never having beaten Kibler at this level. Yeah, and it, or or almost any level. <laughs> uh, so ben, ben, I think, is happy about picking up some wins. Here's a good place to do it. Ben did 6-0 the draft rounds, so he got yeah. past a lot of people. He's looking to pick up uh, some wins in Constructive now, though. Sure. Activate Wildwood. Sure. I'd like to attack, Brian Kibler says. Ben's letting him attack, because this way, if Brian attacks with two creatures, he doesn't get the Noble Hierarch bonus. And uh, Ben is able to then kill those creatures. It doesn't really matter. Like Especially if he wants to just kill one of them. Mm -hmm. He takes less damage if he lets them both attack first. And he, he can Lightning Bolt the Ooze and then Cryptic Command bouncing the Wildwood if he wants. Exactly. So it looks like he's probably just going to end up Cryptic Commanding that after bolting the ooze. Since you don't want uh, your, uh, very many spells in your graveyard before you, uh, will the ooze is in play. Before blocks, obviously. Four blocks, Ben says. Let's bolt the ooze. Normally yep. it's bolt the birds, but... <laughs> ben also has the option here to uh, play a Snapcaster, flashback the Lightning Bolt, and then just block the Stirring Wild with a Lightning Bolt, trading the Snapcaster for the, the Stirring Wild instead. So th those are both pretty strong options. Looks like that's what he's actually going to run with. The only problem with that is that Kibler does have a path to exile. Another ooze? Before the locks. Oh. Yeah, as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, target that's the only yeah. card. Yeah. Before the locks, you're going to path. Okay, so I, uh, path to exile path. on the Snapcaster Mage, as uh, Luis predicted. Looks like Ben has five basic lands in his deck, which is actually a lot more than decks like these normally play. And, uh, so he, he's not going to run out of targets anytime soon for Path or Ghost Quarter. Even though the Snapcaster got exiled, he still has f flashback on that Lightning Bolt until yeah. end of turn. Yeah, yeah he's he's able to to bolt the Noble Hierarch now, since he might as well. 
Ben is down to four, and with two Aether Vials in play, he, he could, you know, be dangerously low, especially since Kibler does have things waiting to jump out. In this case, it locks it on Smiter, but Ben can't always tell, so it looks like... So Go. Ben is just going to attack with Snapcaster Mage, and we hear from one of the back tables that Josh Hutter Layton, uh, your, your teammate, has Indeed. taken game one from Craig Wesco. All right. So Kibler drew a Wiltleaf Liege, I think, and it looks like he, he wishes he had those vials up on four. He's probably not actually going to play it until he can move vial up to four, since running into a counter spell is just that devastating. So Josh, make, Josh, Josh trying to make a, a, a huge comeback after one-twoing his draft that we thought he was going to do really, really well in. Uh, and he's, I mean, he's still in it. Yeah, no, he's, he's definitely uh, in good shape here. Uh, I think that uh, I think that uh, if he four. wins out in he, in these rounds, he yeah. actually has a good shot at making top four. Right. So Kibler just passes the turn, and Ben draws <laughs> uh, a mana leak, which is not really high on his list of priorities. Here, right. <laughs> facing down a, a pair of either vials. All right. Still has cryptic commands in his hand. One, two, three of them. Well, he, he had to use one last turn to not oh. die, but he has still got a, a full grip of cryptics. And Reed Duke continues the absolute heater that he's on, taking down Shahar Shanhar. Putting him to two nine and two. Putting him to nine and two. That's a, I mean, that's a pretty good record against this field. Yeah, I think, uh, I think he has every right to be very happy with it. And he's not the only one. I know, uh, he, you know, Hall of Fame elect uh, Huey Jensen yeah. is, uh, <laughs> you know, watching with uh, great anticipation. Oh, Voice of Resurgence, which is a big, big card against Ben. Yeah, and because Kibler has uh, moved up the vials, I guess he's not, he's mm -hmm. electing not to vial it in. <sighs> ben, predicting the Wiltleaf Leash that Kibler actually does have, since Kibler moved the vial up to four after keeping it on three for a while. Ben, Ben's uh, under some pressure here. Kibler's got all his four fours out, and th those actually do survive Ben's burn spells very well. And Ben's only at four. Yeah, they are threatening lethal. Voice Resurgence on the stack here. Kibber sitting on only one card, but it might be as good as all of Ben's cards put together, depending <laughs> on how things play out here. Counter it and uh, bounce the... Uh... Bounce the Ether Wild with four. <laughs> I don't know if I should bounce the Wildwood or the Smiter. This is what I've been thinking about. Um, He's going to bounce one of Kibler's mana, creatures. Comes back for free. That is basically free either way. Okay, <laughs> Ben Stark doing a little out loud figuring. Ciphering, if you will. Yeah, which is uh, generally uh, his style. I guess the Smiter has to make more sense. Okay. So he bounces, locks on Smiter. I will uh, activate certain level. So Ben's going to block. He's going to try to electrolyze that thing end of turn, but then uh, Kilber's going to vial in the Wilt Leaf Leech. Bam. Gets it bigger. So I bet Ben wishes he had Supreme Verdict uh, in his deck now, but unfortunately he doesn't look like he's playing any Wraths. I wish I didn't put that to three. Any in the sideboard? He's got the Hallowed Burials yeah. in the sideboard. Right, right, but, as we talked about before. But yeah, he does not have Supreme Verdict you know. itself. <laughs> I can deal with Cryptic best this way. So. I can't have Stone all of it. Um... Go. Oh, locks it on Smiter is the one he ether vials in. Yeah, so Ben is under enough pressure here that even with all these cryptics, he's not able to actually get any headway. Um, he's just delaying his own death. So he has to like bounce strong Wildwood, tap all of Brian's creatures, and that doesn't really get him to a point where he's going to be able to win. The now game. there's a there's a tricky timing thing here because. Brian can say tax, mm -hmm. and if Ben waits for Brian to activate yeah, so the, Brian, the, the stirring Wildwood, he, he can, Brian can then just go, I'll attack with these two, since we both pass priority. So, yeah, uh, Brian basically just passes in his pre-combat, lets Ben do something. If Ben does something, he activates, he, Brian can activate Wildwood and attack. If Ben doesn't do anything, Brian just gets to attack with his non-Wildwood creatures. 
So Ben did have to bounce the strong wildwood and uh, and tap Ryan's other creatures. And here's where having deckless comes into play in a pretty big way, since okay. Brian knows he can just play all his creatures now. He, it does not actually uh, yep. matter for Ben. The, ben does have a Gideon Juror in his deck. That would be a nice draw here. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like we're going to cryptic the ooze and draw a card. Since he's got to gotta start, gotta start getting okay. somewhere here. Ben Stark with his yep. back really That's up against yep. it here against <laughs> Brian Kibler. Round 11 action from the 2013 World Championship. With uh, Kibler doing, getting a lot of mileage out of his Stirring Wildwood. There's a Lightning Helix off would, the top for Ben. Which been a, would have been a welcome sight earlier. Now it combines with Electrolyze to kill like a Wilt Leaf Liege, but and that puts Ben up to six since uh, he, I don't think his life total has been adjusted from the fetch land yet. Ben is considering when he wants to kill it and kill the liege. Um, one and one. Okay. Doing one to the smiter, hoping to draw another bolt off the off the electrolyze. Kibler's hands are empty there on the right hand side of your screen. But uh, both hands are about to be empty in a second here. <laughs> so, yeah, if Ben drew another bolt, he could bolt, bolt, you know, Helix bolt the two four fours that each had a damage on them. But he uh, then he, he didn't, and then uh, Strong like Wild plus the, the locks on Spider, we're going to get him. I know. All right, game one to Brian funny. Kibler yeah. in the, this action. A, a loss yeah. here doesn't Bouncer completely dies, knock Ben Stark them. out. Uh, a loss certainly kicks Kibler to the curb. Yeah, Kibler needs this win a lot more than Ben does, though they both would much like to have it. Uh, ben has some good sideboard options here. The two Hallowed Burials are pretty strong. And we'll take a look at those in a second here. We've got also uh, Baneslayer Angel and Threads of Disloyalty. So those are pretty, those are pretty sweet. Qualifiers for the next Pro Tour have begun. You could be on the big stage for the Pro Tour Born of the Gods taking place February 21st to 23rd in Valencia, Spain. For more information, visit wizards.com slash PTQ. And we're also going to take a look at one of the significant cards in that match. I think I actually, I think I actually yeah, messed uh, up the, kind of, of, of my guys. I should have put the, there are a lot the of cards were flying around there, but uh, this one in particular did then, have a pretty big impact on how things played out. And in fact was part of the most complicated one. stack of the game, which yeah. is kind of I'm funny like, because really, that stack actually, involved don't know. multiple cards in the graveyard. And, the it wasn't, but, and it wasn't the only complicated like, stack in that game. Yeah, which they're talking about right now. All right, there's Aven Mind Sensor. It's certainly an anti-combo card because it prevents people from searching the most, the, the like biggest part of their library. They can still search, the, search the top four, <laughs> but you're not going to be able to pull everything out of it. We can we see it was featured as part of Sam Party's GP Portland winning sideboard. Um, I didn't know about this, that last point. Yeah, it, it, getting Flash is actually much more interesting of a card, too, because now you can actually play it in response to, like I said, my, there are mystical teachings, but also just the fetch lands, as we saw in that game, Gifts Ungiven, all, all sorts of different effects. And it's, Avon Mind Sensor has been a significant part of Modern since there was Modern. Yeah, because of the mana base of, you know, the, the Scalding Tarns and Verdant Catacombs and all the other Zendikar fetch lands, plus the Ravnica shock lands, you, you end up... Uh, ha being able to hit people's mana bases all, almost all the time, and then Scapeshift has been a big deck ever since Modern started. And it's uh, primarily good against Scapeshift with, again, applications against uh, Pod, which is actually what Sam Party was playing when he won the Grand Prix. <laughs> right. So it's good in his deck and against his deck. But uh, Avon Mind Sensor has, as we saw in that game, it, it's mostly there against combo decks, but it can hamper Ben's mana development. I wouldn't be surprised if Kibber actually just took them out, though. Since he's got uh, Thrun, the Last Troll, and Sword of War and Peace, which both present much bigger threats. Yeah, Thrun is Thrun is a big time problem for, yeah, for Ben Stark. Yeah, you don't need the Aether Vial; it's already uncounterable. It, you have to Wrath it away. Luckily, Ben's uh, actually Hallowed Burials do get around regeneration, which Wrath of God itself does, but Supreme Verdict does not. But Avid Mind Sensor, despite its uh, utility that game, the fact that it lets Ben pick up free cards off Electrolyze is just a little too much, I think. So. 
Kibler, his sideboard plan might involve leaving them in, but so much of his deck is actually good against men that there aren't that many cards he'd want to take out. All right, sweeping down to the overhead view of the feature match area. Ben Stark on the left, Brian Kibler on the right. I'm Sheldon Mennery sitting beside Luis Scott Vargas, and we are in round 11 action, 2013 Magic Gathering World Championships from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. This would be your third trip to uh, event here? Uh, this is actually my second. I, I was here for the Pro Tour in Amsterdam in 2010, but I actually didn't go before you were in the two You weren't here in the 2004 one? No, no, 2004 was a little before I started playing, so. Uh, ben shuffling his now Counter Magic Light deck is my guess. <laughs> uh, as you saw last game, Aether Vials and Voice of Resurgence and Locks on Smiter all make uh, counter spells a lot less good. So. What does, does Kipler need Aether Vial? I mean, is, it, is, is, is he an, an underdog if he doesn't play in a game that he doesn't play in Aether Vial? No, no, definitely not. His his cards are all very castable. Either of just makes his deck flow much more smoothly. And it also makes the stirring wildwoods that he has. He has only a pair of them, but it makes them much better if he draws them. Also, a big part of his deck, too, is getting Leon and Arbiter out and then ghost quartering his opponent's lands or tectonic edging his lands. So having either vial does let him use those without uh, much incident. <laughs> All right, little, the previous, uh, little jocularity between <laughs> the two <laughs> pros. Uh, you know, the one thing I noticed about this tournament, I, I, I noticed it about it last year, I, I noticed it this year. These guys are all pretty loose. You know, they've they've come here. They're, there's a lot on the line, but what makes great champions great champions, and you've got to be a champion to get here, is the ability to not really be affected by the externals. Yeah, and as you can see with uh, Brian and Ben talking, and even though you know they're they're good friends, uh, normally you have this level of like camaraderie and casualness at this tournament, which was here last year when I played in it, and I've observed it here this year, where. Even though there's a lot on the I line, you're playing with people you know well, you're playing with people who you respect, and it's easier to be a little more relaxed. You, you know your opponents aren't trying to get you, you know? Yeah, right. Good luck. You too. All right, we hear that Stanislav Sivska has come back in game two, tied up his match with Yuya okay. Watanabe. So. Okay, we're on the, we're on the draw. Ben, ben happy with his opening well. hand. Land. Kibler not so much. <laughs> Kibler... I mean, the hand they kept last time was actually pretty bad. Saying so six land. Six. Yeah, it was on six. I had yeah. Vile and wild, Wildwood and, like, you know, a little bit of disruption. Like, eh, You're certainly going to keep it. Yeah. All right, so, I so mean, Kibler, like the Kibler being hand is right. I'm just gonna bolt something or whatever, you know? on the draw is Obviously not quite as bad for hand, you can't just go to going, to the, going to six. Yeah, I... I mean, he would probably still choose to play first, even knowing he was going to six. But if you're going to mulligan, you know, being on the draw actually is not as bad as it could be. Since, uh, especially, it gives you another shot at hitting, like, the turn one either vial. And, obviously and it gives you another, a good yeah. shot at having enough lands to work with. Get a quick look at Ben Stark's hand momentarily as the spotter got plenty of one puts them up. Deck, so. It looked like a two-lander to me when he was drawing it, <laughs> yeah, but uh, we'll, we'll see what, uh, what ends up happening in, in, in a few minutes here. <laughs> Well, if it's a, it's a two-lander, he goes the, into the tank thinking about it, doesn't he? Yeah, but if it's like two lands, a pyroclasm, which I saw in like three drop, that's usually just going to be a keep. You can't you can't mulligan that aggressively. I mean, Ben is a proponent of mulligan aggressively, but that, that, even that's a little bit much. Are they done? And Craig Wesco has come back in his match against Josh Hutter Layton to tie it up at one game apiece. Yeah, that's uh, the black-green Jund, minus the Jund part. It's just black-green, you know, mid-range. Uh, in Josh's hands against uh, West Coast white-black deck. Please, you're honest. So I, I do like the white-black tokens deck, for what it's worth. I, I appreciate honesty. <laughs> so, all right, so you, said, you said you said Ben choice. is like, I wouldn't want a, a relatively yeah, aggressive mulligan. We know that <laughs> Martin Yuza is very random. aggressive <laughs> at <laughs> the mulligan. Who's the most aggressive? Uh, it's definitely Martin. Martin it, Martin takes the cake. He And actually, the last pro tour Amsterdam wanted a mulligan a hand unlimited of, like, three land, a two drop, a three drop, and uh, another three drop because, or sorry, it was two land, a two three drops, and a four drop because it didn't have a two drop. But it was a six card hand already. <laughs> it's like Martin, you were insane. That being said, he probably, uh, you know, knows what he's talking about. He won l the last two Grand Prix Bochums. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that does look like a two lander. Sorry, Sphinx's Revelation. 
cryptic command. But he's got Pyroclasm and Threads of Disloyalty. Threads of Disloyalty is particularly effective against Voice of Resurgence, so that is one of your best answers to it. Kibler showing the judge there. That's Netherlands Judge Tyne Zeip. I will not try to pronounce that. <laughs> <laughs> and turn two scavenging news from Brian Kibler. That scavenging news presents all kind of problems for Ben's flashback spells. Yeah, it, it not only hits like his think twices and that sort of thing, even though he only has two of those, I suppose, it also really gets this four snapcaster mages, makes them much weaker than they would be normally. So those things are annoying. It's also annoying to Ben that you can't always lightning bolt or electrolyze it because sometimes it becomes a 4-4 four, four, or a 5-5. Five, five. So he's going to have to deal with it early if he deals with it. There's threads of disloyalty right there. It's the littlest control magic. <laughs> <laughs> so it all steals something that's cheaper than it, but it does it in a very effective fashion. I've seen a, this card take a lot of Tarmogoyts and Dark Confidence in my time. And yeah, nowadays, I guess Voice of Resurgence is one of the premier targets for it. Uh, Rashad <laughs> Miller fills us in that Mind Harvest is the littlest control. Mind Harness, yeah. This harness <laughs> is the littlest control magic. So Ben forced to think twice, miss a land drop, and potentially get his think twice eaten by scavenging us here. Attack you. Okay, Brian goes in and attacks. Eat, think twice. Yep, it's gone. And then eat, think twice, he says, and voice of resurgence. Already looking very, very bad in this game for Ben Stark. Yeah, he has some cards that'll help him come back, but if he doesn't draw lands very soon here, he's going to be in trouble. He can pyroclasm these creatures away, and he, he has drawn a land here, so threadsing the, the Voice of Resurgence is actually a fairly good way to start coming back. Three left. I have four cards. Since Ben would get the elemental if the Voice were to die. And the Scavenging News doesn't have any fodder, so he Kibber can't even really attack it into the Voice. some degree, Ben's probably thinking about which land he wants to fetch if he does end up going with that play. <laughs> One thing ben, ben is doing I never do, which is people, they've missed a land drop, then they draw their land and think about whether they're going to play it or not. Right. I always just play it. I mean, uh, you are going to play it, but I guess it uh, l l l gives your opponent less information about what you're thinking about. I don't know. I, I just always just play my land. <laughs> <laughs> I can't fault right. Ben for it, but... There's Scalping Tarn for oh, Ben Stark. And is he getting a basic? So for the, mo for the most part in modern, you don't have to do 20 points of damage to somebody to kill them. <laughs> no. For the most part, you, you have to do like 14. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that might be optimistic. I know the, the deck that uh, Josh and Ephron Webb are playing has Thought Seizes and Fetch Lands and Dark <laughs> Confidant. So sometimes you don't even have to do 10 damage to them. Oh, look. Ben found himself a voice of resurgence. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The very disloyal voice of resurgence see Kibler has going here. If Kibler has a Wildly Fleege does let him attack by it, but Ben's just probably going to have to take his licks and then end up pathing the Wildly Fleege at some point. Uh, take three. three. Yep. Down Voice of Resurgence, certainly a major player at the last Pro Tour. And Ben has a lot of Paths to Exile in his hand. He has multiple of them of different versions, which bothers me, as always, but uh, <laughs> I'm just kind of neurotic like that, but uh, either way, it still does the same thing. So Ben is going to be able to block the scavenging of his path to Wildly Fleege and potentially uh, get Kibler pretty wrecked if Kibler doesn't doesn't anticipate this. I'm not saying it's a bad attack by on Kibler's part, but it is one of the things he has to be concerned with and probably not happy about. He's, he doesn't have a ton of options, though, since I mean his deck is mostly creatures and mostly sorceries. His other alternative is to attack with just the Wiltly Fleege and just to see what happens. And there's a Tectonic Edge, and it's going to take out the Steam Vents. Yeah, that does cut down on the range of what Ben could have, since now you've ruled out any Electrolyzes, Lightning Helixes, or Lightning Bolts, which is good information. So it looks like Kibber debating the attack. I mean, you're, you're always sending in a Wiltly Fleege here. The question is, what, what are you sending Scavenging News? And I think it is, is a good idea to not send it in. You, you avoid getting wrecked by Path to Exile, and uh, you end up ha keeping a Scavenging News on your side of the board, which is a lot better than trading it for a voice, which then gives Ben a token. On the other hand, if Kibler doesn't get aggressive, Ben is already at 11. It's possible that he get, giving Ben three life is something he can't afford. So I think I favor not attacking with the Scavenging News, but it's also kind of cheating because uh, <laughs> I know Ben has Path to Exile in hand. <laughs> right. But I think even from Kibler's perspective, it makes sense to do this. Okay, so Wiltly Fleege battles in. Ben and most likely thinking just about passing it, it and making the decision. 
Path to Exile. So Brian Kibler will get the search out of basic land and put it into play tapped. Uh, rather unnecessary fifth land. I mean, he's his deck doesn't can't use that much mana, so he's it's not as much big of a disadvantage. If you were to path Ben's creature, it'd be a lot better for Ben than this one is for Kibler. Yeah, the only real deep mana usage Kibler has is scavenging ooze, maybe yeah. eating a lot of things from a graveyard. Yeah, like sometimes he activates Storing Wildwood and plays a spell in the same turn, but that doesn't seem like the, the, the case here. All right, back to Ben Stark's turn. Oh. And yeah. he puts back down a fourth land the second time. Yeah, he's, he's happy enough just drawing lands and passing the turn. Brian has got a, a locks on Smiter here, but and another scavenging is, but he doesn't really want to commit too much to the board. He, he's kind of forced to now, but I'm sure he's not happy about it. Go ahead. Okay, locks it on Smiter. Cards left? I have two cards. Ben with a whole grip full of options here. Is a, is a great card in this matchup, obviously, because it can't be countered. I mean, that's, yeah. that's huge. Yeah. There aren't very many three casting cost spells Killer could play into a Cryptic Command and have them resolve, but uh, that is one of them. Killer debating, eating lands with scavenging is deciding it's not really worth anyone's <laughs> time. <laughs> uh, speaking of uncountable spells, uh, Thrun just showed up. Yeah, that's that's Sphinx's revelation in yeah, sure. Beastark's hand is not going to be it's just not going to be enough if Kibler can just keep putting the pressure on. Yeah, I mean, the fact that Ben has a Hallowed Burial in his hand does mean that he's got a little bit of time here since he can always just wait, chump with the voice like he just did, and then Hallowed Burial away all of Kibler's creatures. Kibler has to be sensitive to that too, so even though if he plays a Thrun here, it's not quite as victorious as it would be against a Supreme Verdict deck. You got a Thrun? Good. Okay. Th run for Brian. Kibler, two cards left in his hand as he passes the turn back to Ben Stark. Um, ben, considering a revelation for two here. What's the advantage of the end of your turn. doing that now? He's going to crack, he's gonna crack uh, a fetch land. The advantage of casting a revelation for two is that Ben has a lot of spells in his hand. So I could definitely see him wanting to just Revelation for two, go up to like six spells in hand, and then have time to play them all. He doesn't want to not Revelation and then end up in a situation where he can't cast it for a bunch of turns. On the other hand, it does get more powerful as the turns go by, but it's, it's interesting. If he gets a, a Shock Land here, he's a little less likely to be casting Revelation. If he gets just straight Basic Mountain, that's you know very clearly going to lead it right into the Revelation. It looks like he's getting a Shock Land tapped, but... Uh, He's going to hold off on the revelation. I, I like that. I mean, I, you know, I'm a big proponent of the revelating for two when you need to, but Ben is not under any pressure. He's, I mean, he's at 10, but Brian doesn't have any two mana flash creatures. So once you hallowed burial, you're not getting attacked the turn after that. And right. you have a cryptic command and a pyroclasm in your hand to, to deal with, and plus another path to deal with other attackers. And at that point, you're just looking for a revelation for four to like finish the game off. So he's holding off on the hallowed burial. Choosing instead to lean on a cryptic command. Sure. Potentially a, a, a path to exile here. Yep. Ten. Yep. Right. Kimbler does eat his arbiter. And I'd like to attack. Go ahead. Would like to attack, he says. <laughs> he would like to attack. I would like to attack. Kimbler usually would like to attack. <laughs> ben Ben allowing it. Ben's gonna chump. On three. Go to three. It's an aggressive line of play by Ben. <laughs> it's funny that, you know, aggressive as in taking a ton of damage, but right. <laughs> it, it is an aggressive control play. He's, t he's basically taking extra damage to hit land drops and to try to draw out more cards from Kilber. though I don't think Kilber's going to play any more cards into Ben's potential wrath. So we, we, we certainly are going to see here Revelation into turn followed up by Hall Hall Burial. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, this is the turn where Ben would want to cast a Revelation. Yeah. And it looks like he's going to, getting a basic mountain. So Ben, not afraid to take a bunch of damage, especially you're playing against a white green deck and they don't have burn spells and they don't have very many ways to play instant speed creatures. So for the most part, Ben is fairly comfortable, you know, keeping his life total low in order to get a more of an advantage out of it. Halibarrel is looking pretty good here. The fact that it kills Thrun and Scavenging Ooze without any sort of, uh, you know, toughness based thing or regeneration mattering is, is very impressive. 
Okay, Sphinx's Revelation. Gonna take Ben back up to five. And out of the immediate danger zone, then, as we discussed, Howard Burial tucks everything. Yeah, just uh, ships all those cards right to the bottom of Kibler's library. Oh, interesting. It looks like Kibler did side in uh, the, his one Torpor Orb against Snapcaster Mage. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I, I certainly can't fault him for that. Since uh, Torpor Orb does mean that uh, coming to play abilities do not, or creatures do not trigger abilities when they come into play. Correct. So that does Those stop Snapcaster Mage primarily. Lane and Arbor and Torpor or Ben Stark's like, what? It's, it's good value because Ben doesn't have any cheap way to get rid of it. He has Cryptic Command, which can bounce it, so yep. that, is, that is a danger, but he doesn't have any way to permanently get rid of it. There's Gideon. <laughs> Jeez, powerful Planeswalkers indeed. Gideon is <laughs> is is actually a, a pretty good one-of. It's In matchups like this, it does a lot of work. He can use it to either blunt... Uh, Brian's attack, or just start picking off Brian's creatures, or eventually both. Yeah, you play it, play it, take it up. Yeah, so he's gonna pyroclasm away Brian's creature and tick up getting up to eight. Voice of Resurgence for Brian Kibler, following up with a scavenging ooze. Which right now has actually, and another side effect of Hallowed Burial is the scavenging news looks like it only has one thing to feed off of, which is makes it not quite as intimidating as it would be otherwise. Uh, it's just the one arbiter in your yard. <laughs> ben Stark doing a quick check of the creatures in the yard. Plus two. As we mentioned. Now, now I think Celestial okay. Colony is going to start doing some work because unless Kibler can find another uh, sure, Ghost Quarter or Tectonic right Edge, here. the uh, Celestial Colony is going to start ambushing. Kibler's creatures that are forced to attack because of Gideon. I would like to attack, says Brian Kibler. I would like to. Um, only thing I didn't think about was which one I wanted to block. Um, ben deciding which one to block. Yeah, I like blocking the ooze first because if you block the voice first, ooze can grow to a 4 4 off the voice and then, right. then your colony can no longer kill it. That's what he does. Kibler passes the turn. Ben plays another Tectonic Edge. Go to, uh, ten. Pick ticks Gideon Jura up to ten. Says go. So it's plus two ability during the uh, opponent's next turn. Creatures that that player controls have to attack Gideon if they can, which means it's basically a fog. I mean, even yeah, worst case scenario, they have a hundred creatures out. <laughs> it, it would be a fog. But in this case, all it's doing is send, making Kibler send in his creatures into the colony over and over again, which is very good for Ben. And then once that's over with, Gideon plus colony does 10 a turn. So the game turns around very quickly. Okay, so. Okay, I'll get a token. Kibler tries Tectonic Edge. Ben says, let's, tr let's bounce that and draw a card. So yeah, he bounces his own colony, actually. But that does trigger Voice of Resurgence. So. Elemental token for yep. Brian Kibler that has power and toughness equal to the number of creatures he controls. Pyroclasm. Pyroclasm. This one died, and I got one from him. Oh, uh, that's just a new one. Yeah. <laughs> a moment of confusion, <laughs> but it does kill both um, creatures, and then and, and then it, Brian gets um, another um, elemental token. Colonnade, yeah. Colonnade and go. Oh, Path to Exile is the know. draw for yep. Brian Kibler. Which will stop the colonnade, but... Gideon is still presenting a huge problem, and Ben just drew another colonnade. Plus two on Gideon. Of course, <laughs> you, you know, you ask, oh, what's Gideon's ultimate? Doesn't really have one. Yeah, his ultimate is turning into a 6-6 regardless of how many counters are on him. Yeah. So Ben can't actually, uh, you know. <laughs> There's Path to Exile for the colonnade. So Ben is yeah, going to be able to search, up for, search for another land, which... Can be pretty important since he's got to go through all, all those colonnade activations and still yeah. keep, keep up some of his counter. Like yeah, it also means if he draws his second Sphinx's Revelation, yeah, then he's going to be able to cast it for a truly massive amount, which at this point is more. Colonnade is path. I, think I just removed it, didn't I? Yeah, oh, he had another colonnade. Yeah, he played too. another okay. one this turn. Yeah, yeah Ben, ben had a second colonnade here. So oh, path Exile is not a Maelstrom Path Yeah, of course, you're probably not going to win, but what else would you do with Path anyway? The game's going to go the same. 
So locks it on Smiter for Brian Kibler. And he passes back to Ben Stark, who now has, there's a Snapcaster Mage, which is far less useful now with Torpor Orb in play. Yeah. Here's a nice shot of Gideon Jura up on the screen. With uh, it being a little a little uh, unfortunate for Ben that Colony can't the kill the Luxon Smiter, but he can kill the token, and Gideon has some counters to burn, as we discussed before. So Ben's got a lot of action left in his hand. Hit you for so you're at 18. Yeah. So comes in, attacks, drops Kibler to 18, and we saw Ben draw a lightning bolt there. Uh, Drawing Tectonic Edge wasn't bad for Kibler. So, yeah, I was just going to ask you if there's um, kill your if there's now. some uh, reason to play oh, Snapcaster just as a beater, and Ben <laughs> answered that <laughs> pretty yeah. quickly. Basically, you, you don't have really high expectations of it doing anything. You're at 18. So, yeah. That's right. uh, it's time to just attack for eight a turn here. Just playing the Snapcaster out makes a lot of sense. All right, so Kibler is now perished. He wasn't literally dead that turn, but he, he could see the writing on the wall. All right, that means yeah. we're going to go to game three. Brian Kibler and Ben Stark. Large implications here for the 2013 Magic the Gathering World Championship. Any sideboard change for either player based on the play and draw switching now? It's uh, <laughs> looking at Ben's sideboard that uh, I don't <laughs> think he brings in anything because of the, the Torpor, but it's possible that Brian might want to adjust for some of the cards Ben has. Although I didn't get to play Fair Magic in the tournament. You can play Magic at a store near you every Friday. Earn Planeswalker points and battle against your friends in Friday Night Magic. August's FNM promo card is Demir Charm. Visit wizards.com slash FNM to find a store near you. FNM. It was the last time you played in an FNM. The last time I played in an actual FNM was probably a couple years, but I, I do play local events every now and then. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't really since I moved to Denver, but for the most part, I do enjoy playing in local drafts. Okay, big, a big card in that match was the Celestial Colonnade. Yeah, I mean, it, as you saw, it, it basically, you know, every now and then it coming into play tapped is, is a hindrance, as you saw in the Martel Budikov match. But in a game like that, your land all of a sudden becomes a 4 4 flyer, just out of nowhere. I mean, your opponents see it coming, but you still get a lot of extra value out of your lands trading for their creatures or eating them for free or killing your opponent. Definitely based on Sarah Angel, because it's a 4 4 vigilant <laughs> guy. Uh, and the, I mean the, the vigilance. The vigilance is a huge thing because that means you still have the mana up to do something with. Yeah, it, it kind of knocks one off the activation cost, and then once you've hit enough lands, it actually lets you attack and block at the same time, which is not the most common use scenario when it <laughs> right. costs five to activate. But it does happen. I mean, Ben or Tom was a, a, a mana short of doing that in his match. So it was a yeah, and almost all the blue red decks just play four colonnades. It's almost a given. In. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was a huge card in the five color control when World Wake was in standard, and it's certainly become a huge card here in modern these days. Yeah, when uh, when when blue white was uh, the best deck in standard, a large part of that was because of a Celestial Colony. All right, so back to the question: any changes in sideboarding? Any additional choices based on the play draw swapping? I, I don't think so. I mean, Ben has seen this, the Torp Orb now, but he's still not going to bring in Wear and Tear, I don't think, just because killing Torp Orb or Aether Vial is not really a best use of his cards. Uh, I think he'd rather just kind of ignore it and hope, or hope Kibler doesn't draw it. Or if mm -hmm. Kibler does draw it, hope he doesn't draw that many Snapcasters. <laughs> right. Uh, the only other option here is, I guess Brian could flip-flop on whether he wants Sword of War and Peace or not, just because it's not good if, Brian, if Ben's killing all your creatures, but right. it is good at not overextending into Hallow Burial. Since if you have one creature in play in a Sword of War and Peace, Ben has to remove it. So ha it, it prevents that you from you from getting into the situation of needing to play a third creature into mm -hmm. a Hallowed Burial. So Ben thinking, looks like... It, one option that Ben does have, though, is he he knows Kibler only has one Torpor Orb, but he could p potentially shave, like, two two Snapcasters, maybe even three, because Kibler does also have Scavenging Oozes. So if his Snapcasters are under that much attack... Maybe you're better off just taking those out and just putting in, you know, a bunch of other cards instead. All right, we'll see if Ben Stark has next leveled Brian Kibler. It, it wouldn't be unthinkable for Ben to put in a Teferi Mage of Zalfir either. 
It's not really the matchup this card is designed for, but it can block some of Kibler's smaller creatures. It's probably a bit too expensive for that, but I would like to see it, just because it's sweet. <laughs> All right, we hear from the back table that Josh utter Layton has taken his match from Craig Wesco. That will position him for a last round win to try to get in. Yep, that's what it looks like. Uh, Wesco did need that win, and but unfortunately for him, it looks like Josh was able to snap it up. Yeah, slim mathematical chance that a 21 gets there, but probably not. Yeah, it, it, it looks like it's unlikely, so. It looks like uh, if we, uh, Shahar is, is pretty much down to the wire. He needs to win his last round. Well, I mean, he's already on a 20. He's already on 24. Oh, he actually, he, he actually made it to 8-2 this round, so. Right. So it looks like Shahar and Reed are playing a, a potential uh, foreshadowing of the top four matchups. Mm -hmm. Very distinctly possible. Which I guess Shahar hopes is not the case because <laughs> right, they a, did not go well for really Shahar. bad matchup for him. And again, like at the pro, like at the Pro Tour, highest seed in the top four chooses to play or draw. Yeah, which is which is very big, especially in modern. The, the older the format gets, the more important it is to play or draw generally. Like it's more important in standard than in, than in uh, limited, and it's more important in modern than in standard. All right, so. Brian Kibler on your right, Thanks. Ben Stark on your left, Both Marshall Sutcliffe behind. <laughs> Both characters uh, uncharacteristically uh, pensive there, but yeah, you can see the you can see the sheen of sweat on Brian Kibler. It is relatively ha it's uncharacteristically warm here in Amsterdam. I guess uh, even for the summer, right? uh, the building <laughs> is without air conditioning. As a matter of fact, you and I are sitting in the only air conditioned spot right now uh, here in our uh, 20 square feet of Whisper Cube. I, I prefer to think of it as the pressure that's on Brian and, and Ben, <laughs> but I, I, that's not actually the case. <laughs> uh, so even though this is a very big match for both of them, I, I don't think that it's well, going to make I, them sweat. Adding, I mean, adding that extra distraction, though, means you just have to be mentally tougher. Yep. So Brian on the play here with, he hopes an either vial. I'm all good. Oh. He does not like it. No. Ben Stark also doesn't like him, so both players are going to go to six. Uh, looks like Ben might be, might be considering not doing so. Oh. No, it looks like Ben, ben is actually good. Oh, he did. He set it aside. It looked like he was chipping it. Well, luckily for him, then uh, you see uh, Chandra perched over on the side there, not getting shuffled back into the deck. <laughs> I wonder if I'd agree to win both shell. I guess I probably would. I'm more the answers. <laughs> I need to see what you have. Well, I don't have a hand, so. Yeah. Well, no, not right now. So Kibler gonna, to draw that. <laughs> Kibler gonna go down to six. <laughs> and so definitely value again, I have. really, definitely really suboptimal when you're on the play already. Yeah, I mean, it's tough, especially since his deck doesn't really have a way to filter its draw steps because he's not playing, you know, he's not playing card draw because he's playing an aggro deck. So if he draws a few too many land or a few too uh, many, like, Aether Vial type cards, he doesn't have a ton of ways to get out of that besides hoping to draw, you know, all spells. And whereas Ben, if Ben floods, he has Fluster Colonnade and he has Sphinx's Revelation and Think Twice. So he has answers to that. Okay. Kibber, really, again, a, a turn on Aether Vial would get him out of this. If he draws, like, two land Aether Vial and all creatures, you know, that puts him in a pretty good spot. So that's kind of what, what he's hoping for. That's reasonable comeback capability. As it turns out, decks that play Aether Vials really want to see them in their opening hand, but uh, <laughs> that, that, that is no, no surprise to anyone, I'm sure. Right. Looks like they're close to the last match still going, though. I saw Stanislav Sifka in play with, like, maybe 15 lands in play, <laughs> which uh, is not unusual given the, the decks they're playing. He's knotted up at 1-1 in his match with Yuya Watanabe. Yuya <laughs> playing, like, all mirrors. <laughs> and they are playing, certainly for the pro points, uh, two yeah. of them out of contention. But pro points are important. Yeah, I mean, a pro point per match is really big, I and mean, that's like you're playing in the top eight of a Grand Prix. So Unfortunately like for Brian Kibler, he's going to go to five. Yeah, which is tough. I mean, you can certainly win off five cards. We all have, but it's not the place you want to be. It is, I mean, Kibler's way, you know, way too used to this to, to really let it shake him, but he certainly can't be happy about it. Right. What's, 
What's the deepest mulligan that you've won off of? Have you won off of, of a four? I won off a four card hand. I, okay. I have not won, won off, off a three, three card hand. I did see uh, David Ochoa win off a three card hand though. <laughs> His three card hand was like Plains, Kami of Ancient Law, Glacial Ray, and Kamigawa Limited. So that was pretty impressive. <laughs> but and Ben's an interesting spot too. When your opponent moves to five, I mean, you do start thinking about, oh man, they're at five. That's good for me. But you also think like. What, what can go wrong? How can I lose to a five-card hand? And sometimes, because right. it, it certainly happens. Yeah, I I think even the even the kindest-hearted of us are mentally <laughs> fist-pump when our, when our opponent goes to five. I mean, you play Magic for the good games. You wouldn't want to play if it was all your opponents mulling to five. When you're playing for the top four of the World Championships, you won't begrudge your opponent <laughs> a, a five-card opening hand. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Ben, ben would say the same thing. Yeah, it, I don't, I don't think there are too many players that go in rooting for their opponents to mulligan, but knowing it is part of the game, then eh, if it happens... You're not going to turn it down. He's not going to... You know, if he had the option to let Kibler draw seven, I, I'd say he would not exercise it. Right. So. Shuffling up and going to pretty tense game three here, though. Uh, again, Ben is uh, looking pretty good. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at his hand soon as uh, he gets a, a water refill. <laughs> Stay hydrated. Stay hydrated. Stay I mean, hydrated. It is important under normal circumstances. And yep. Sure. Uh, you, you can hear in Kipler's sure that he didn't like what he was looking at. Well, if he has an untapped land, he's got Noble Hierarch and Smiter, so he can play a potentially a turn two Loxon Smiter. But and yep. it looks like he actually has the Temple Garden, so he's got an option, or per perhaps Wildwood. Uh, Strong Wildwood, maybe not quite so good here. There goes the Temple Garden. Turn too late. Yep. But he's, he does get to, to have a, a Noble Hierarch out. And with a Smiter in hand, he's still got, you know, potential pressure coming out here. Yeah, I mean, he's... Go. Steam Bents for uh, into play tap for Ben Stark. So, yeah, that, I mean, that, that Smiter is... Go. It is large. And Ben could have Lightning Helixed it, the, the Noble Hierarch, but chose not to. He also has a Lightning Bolt. Let's just take a look at Ben's hand. He's also got a Lightning Bolt and a Halibar and a Baneslayer Angel. So Ben has has a, a very good hand here. No standard turn two think twice. He, he's no, no, he's got to be worried hands. about that Loxon Smiter, but at this point he, his only yeah, options are to either take five a turn from it or double bolt it. So neither of those are, are wonderful. Well, wait, he's, he good. has, has a Baneslayer Angel in his hand, and that can rebuild your life total really, really yeah. fast. Yeah, Baneslayer is amazing in this matchup, money. though. Sorry, Kibler <laughs> does <laughs> have a path to exile in his hand, so <laughs> if Ben's leaning on that Baneslayer too hard, he might you know, find the rug pulled out from under him. So what's your line of play here uh, if you're Ben Stark? I think ben if you're Stark Ben, stays. you actually just you know bite the bullet and double bolt the Hierarch, or the Loxon on Smiter, rather. It's it's not what you want to do, but your hand has two really, really powerful five drops, so not taking ten damage off it is probably the best. Let's see what Ben ends up doing. I'm gonna bolt a helix smiter. Looks like that is the plan. And he's taking and the line that you suggested. Yeah. It's two for one. With but a sigh in his voice. I mean he he already you know, was up two cards on Kilber because of the mulligan, so getting two for one yourself isn't so bad, but no, no magic player willingly gets two for one without, sure. without at least complaining about it. <laughs> so, Kibber hey. is actually drawing a good proportion of lands here. Sure. All right, looks yeah. like he's going to play another smiter. Yeah, so this is, has to make Ben pretty happy about his line of play there because had he not done that, he was potentially facing on way too much damage before casting this Wrath. K Kibler also files up follows up with an Aether Vial. His only remaining card in hand is that Path to Exile that we talked about a minute ago. Yeah, so now Ben has the choice. He can either Electrolyze the Hierarch, which saves him a point of damage and cuts Kibble off of, of mana, or he can uh, or he can just wait and, and get it for free with the Hallowed Burial. The problem is with the Stirring Wildwood in play, you don't really want the Hierarch to, be, to live here, so... Yeah, it looks like he's gonna yeah. take that down. Draws a Snapcaster. Yeah. So he didn't side out all of them. No, I don't think he was going to, but I, I could see cutting cutting down on them. Yeah, Kibler actually would not have minded drawing a land there. Okay. Another Aether Vial for Brian Kibler. Since he would have gotten hit with the Stirring Wildwood. Scalding Tarn, it looks like, for Ben Stark. He's going to auto-crack it. Yeah, it looks like... 
Ben is going to cast and the Bane Slayer. And, and Brian says, well, while you're in there, you might as well get a basic land. Yep. And it looks like Ben did side in the Wear and Tear, so he was interested in killing Aether Vile and potentially Torpor Orb. Carry on. All right, so... So one bullet averted for Brian Kibler, although now his hand is empty. Yeah, but he isn't in the worst shape. Ben's at 15. If Brian draws a land, he gets to hit Ben for seven. And if he doesn't draw a land, well, he's drawing a spell. And as long as it's not a third either vial, he's pretty happy about most spells he could draw here. Especially since Ben is tapped out. Yeah, he, he, he knows what's happening. Is you know What he gets to do is going to happen. There's the smiter. So clearly he drew a spell of and some kind. He says go. Island is the draw for Ben Stark. Yeah, so He's, Ben... He go. plays one of the tectonic edges. Interested in uh, trading Celestial Colonnade for for Loxon Smiter here, I believe. Or he actually has the Snapcaster, so he could potentially do a play with Electrolyzer Lightning Helix. There is Noble Hierarch, which is important because it has Exalted and is going to give the Smiter plus one, plus one. Yeah, which is going to bring it out of range of either Colonnade or Snapcaster plus Electrolyze, both of which Ben would have preferred to do. And Scavenging Ooze. He vials into Scavenging Ooze. Huge, huge, huge play for Brian Kibler. This is eight. So now Ben's in, in a spot where I think he actually just chumps because he's going to ha cast Hallowed Burial here. So we're still at pretty much parity with Ben getting the first draw step, but, I mean, things are going much better for Kibler than he could have expected. Uh, until Ben draws Sphinx's Revelation, that is. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Looks so, like, Hollow, he's, he's got to play the Hollow Barrier now. Yeah, you don't, you don't want to just take a giant hit here. And so, Scavenging Goose is going to reduce Ben's uh, Snapcaster targets significantly. <sighs> Brian takes the Bolt, the mana from the Noble Hierarch. Now... Ben can't use Tectonic Edge on Brian right now because he only has three lands. But once Brian drops another land in order to activate the Wildwood, yeah. then he can strip it. Yeah, unless unless Brian, you know, had a Noble Hierarch or something to activate it without paying mana, then he would not be able to do that. So Brian can force Ben to use Tectonic Edge here because he drew a Temple Garden, but he's not he's not faced down with some good choices. And uh, the fact that Ben drew the... Basically, his finisher is, does not bode well for Brian. All right, no cards in hand for Brian Kibler. Lots of cards in hand for Ben Stark in a second here. Yeah. Brian choosing not to play the Temple Garden. I think he wants to wait till Ben taps out or till Brian draws his own Tectonic Edge or Ghost Quarter. I when I didn't get attacked by Colony, it was bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think and Brian makes a disgusting <laughs> noise. <laughs> so fast to not yeah, slow roll. Sphinx's Revelation right. for six for Ben Stark. Not only does that, yeah, that refill his hand, that as fast as I can. buffs up his life total to 16. Yeah, including chaining into another Sphinx's Revelation, which is going to make this game exceedingly difficult for Brian to come back from. All right, Ben Stark, tapping a few mana. He's going to start finishing the things off with this Colonnade here. Attacking with Colonnade, that will drop Brian Kibler to 13. Yep. So, at best, three turns for Brian. Because he doesn't have too many reach or flying guys, does he? Yeah, well, <laughs> he has a Stirring Wildwood, which can chump because it does have reach, but Ben does have a tectonic edge, so it's going to be kind of hard to actually manage that. And uh, Brian did draw a path to exile, but... Path it? E yeah. E even though even if he does end up pathing it, it's still going to be really tough for for Ben to, to, to lose this game. The second Sphinx's Revelation really is the nail in the coffin, along with the, the six removal spells. Setting options can't be good for me. I mean, <laughs> Brian's saying yeah, yeah, options sorry, cannot be <laughs> no, good for me. Yeah, I know. Uh, there we see Ben Stark's hand. Lightning Bolt, Path to Exile, Path to Exile, Pyroclasm, Electrolyze, Revelation, and Cryptic Command. Um, yeah, I'll just draw, counter draw. Yep. Counter and draw, says Ben Stark. Go. Choosing just to try to finish this game off. Kibler potentially being able to attack for three here. Again, Tectonic Edge is still kind of throwing a damper into that. And he had enough mana to do that because the Celestial Colonnade doesn't <laughs> tap. Bam. Yeah. Ed, Kibler's a turn away from just getting bolted to death. Or he actually has the Electrolyze too, so yeah. That's he actually true. could just Electrolyze bolt him once he's... I guess I should have responded, but... Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, eat your uh, <laughs> I might respond to that. Are there any other creatures in the yards? In response to that... How many more? 
<laughs> so Kibler, yeah, Kibler casts <laughs> scavenging um, ooze, fine. which goes through, or vials in a scavenging ooze, and starts <laughs> eating things. Ben debating whether to try to, like, burn Kibler out by pathing scavenging ooze and then burning in response, but at this point he's just going to let it happen and then eventually just path it and then attack with the colony next turn. So Brian does gain three life from that, taking him back up to eight. Ben Stark sitting comfortably at 16. And there's the path for your ooze. Brian searches up the first basic land that he comes to, which is the planes. Just gonna electrolyze you. And to turn, Ben says, I'm going to electrolyze you. Yeah. That's going to draw him a card. Now Ben has just double bolt in his hand, so he does not really need to go much further than that. So attack with colonnade, bolt, bolt, and so this attack. should be short work. Sure, okay. chump block with the wildwood. Uh, there's no creatures in yards now, right? No. Nope. Bolt you. Okay. Bolt you. Okay. There's the have? game. Ben Stark has taken uh, down Brian Kibler two games to one yeah. and made a strong and argument to, to get player, himself so into the top four player. of this event, probably knocking Brian Kibler well, out of contention really with 18 five, points. That was, like was some play. Yeah. That it definitely yeah, was. I mean, that matchup yeah. is going to have a yeah. lot of back and Once forth, and uh, it's certainly del delivered. Yeah, again, we saw that, that Brian mulligan to five in that game. So that means Ben Stark, who came into this tournament 0-4-2 oh, and two against Brian Kibler lifetime, is now 3-4-2, and two. Now three, four and two, having beaten him three times in the Swiss rounds. It's an impressive comeback, and this is a good place to get your wins. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we see that uh, Stanislav Sivka and Yuyu Watanabe are still playing, so it looks like we're going to get over there. And they've got, like I said before, a lot of lands in play, <laughs> <laughs> which is not too surprising in the, in the blue out red mirror. This is game three in this match. Yuya, Stanis there on your left, Stanislav Sivka on your right. But we are coming back to the booth. I'm Sheldon Mennery. He's Luis Scott Vargas. And we are covering the Magic, the 2013 at Magic the Gathering World Championships. Just seen very exciting round 11 action between Hall of Famers Ben Stark, Brian Kibler. B Stark takes that one down. Yeah, I mean, it was a close match. And even though Kibler's mulligan to five was actually fairly close, but uh, Ben, you know, drew the Sphinx's Revelation, which is kind of what his deck is designed to play to, and that would pretty much end of the game. Yeah, when when you're at a comfortable enough life total, like eight or so, and can cast a big Revelation. Yeah, I think you drew six cards there. <laughs> right, that's, that's really rough times for uh, the aggressive decks, especially the Hollowed Burial before... Yeah, Hallowed of. Burial especially is very effective against Kibler's deck since uh, it kind of ignores a lot of the protection he has built in. Yeah. Looks like we're going to go down to the feature match area. And Marshall Sutcliffe. Hi, I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. Oh, wait, I'm actually Rashad Miller. <laughs> and I'm here... <laughs> and I'm here with Ben Stark. And uh, I don't know if you knew this, but coming into this tournament... You had not beaten Brian Kibler in a competitive tournament. Oh, I do it. Believe me, I do it. <laughs> I do so, it very well. I play him all the time, and he always crushes me. <laughs> so how does it feel? Does it feel like you actually not, you know, got a monkey off your back with um, these three wins now? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, uh, you know, losing him over and over and over again. And it's funny, too, because he's a very good deck builder, and I am a very good drafter. And he had beaten me in draft tons of times, too. So in this tournament, we played in both draft pods, and I did I did beat him. And he had some good decks, and he played really well. And then here, uh, you know, it was a really tough match, but he molded the five and drew double either vial. So, like, he didn't really have any threats in game uh, three. Okay, speaking of his deck building, I know that he tested with you guys in the uh, Channel Fireball guy, Sand. He, he never really ever ends up playing the Channel Fireball deck. How did the matchups work out in your playtesting if you actually got to do any testing with Brian? Well, me and Brian have been testing together for every Pro Tour for like three years. But actually, uh, to not have like a nine-man group, because Channel Fireball qualified so many people for this, we kind of split into two groups. And uh, he tested with David Ochoa, Josh Utter Layton, and Eric Froelich, while I tested with Martin Yuza, Shuei Nakamura, Stanislav Sivka, and uh, Yuya Watanabe. So I didn't actually test with Brian for this tournament. All right, that's interesting. All right, so this was uh, Ben Stark. He's now 8-3. This is Rashad Miller. Sending it back to the booth. 
All right. Thanks, Rashad, for that report and nice interview with, with Ben Stark. We're going to get over to the Yuyu Watanabe and Stanislavsk match here in a minute. And I think you already alluded to what decks they're playing. Yeah, it looks like they're both the blue, red, red mirror. So we'll take a look at uh, what's going on there. All right. We're going to go right back down to the feature match area. All right, from over top, we have... <laughs> Looks like a War of Snapcaster Mages. <laughs> war of Snapcaster Mage. Uh, Yu Watanabe at 12, Stanislav Sifka at 9. We are tied 1-1. There's Yuya's Hand, Gideon Jura, Spell Snare, Shadow of Doubt, Sphinx's Revelation to Fetchlands. So he was actually just looking through uh, Stanislav's graveyard and counting it and just trying to see what exactly Stanislav had left in his deck. His graveyard was big enough that he could actually try to see what he had left to deal with in this game. So we've got a pretty late game. He's primarily looking at the number of tectonic edges that he had left to deal with. Okay, so he activates and attacks, and Stanislav says bounce draw. Trying to stop the colony that, uh, hit for a turn. It looks like Stanislav's down three tectonic edges, which, according to their list, was actually all the ones they play. So that is uh, something that they were both players are keenly aware of. You deciding whether he wants to fight over the cryptic command or not? Here in modern, uh, graveyard order does not matter. There are some older formats in which it does. So you you moving some cards around in Stanislav's graveyard while technically not correct doesn't really have any impact on play it is nice that actually that rule has been implemented since just the way you know things are these days it, it is a lot easier if you can move things around even if that's not what you're supposed to do exactly it just ends right. up happening a lot so yeah looks like he is okay with that content to get in for two to a turn or try to at least Stanislav has uh, quite a few cards in his hand as well. He uh, looks like sitting on Electrolyzed Mana Leak and some Spell Snares. As well as another Snapcaster Mage. Yeah. So, when you're playing the Blue White Red Mirror, you're certainly not rarely going to be short on mana or options. And in this case, uh, Stanislav has m many of both. Spell Snare mostly going to take out Snapcasters? Yeah, that's its best use is to counter Snapcaster Mage. Uh, you do have to worry about Mana Leak as well, and sometimes the random Shadow of Doubt that stops <laughs> your land, but right. for the most part, Snapcaster Mage is the card you want to target with Spell Snare. Okay, Stanislav electrolyzes that. Draws one, and Gideon Jura is his response. It's a good follow-up. If you could resolve Gideon, that's a, a pretty big point in your favor, especially since uh, Stanislav doesn't have any colonnades right now to fight, fight it with. Yeah, it's only two hits from Gideon, from Gideon Jora that will kill Stanislav Sivka. And he does have Snapcasters for, like, potential path to exiles or other cryptic commands to kind of stop it, but Yuya does, isn't forced to activate it until Stanislav's tapped out or, or Yuya has enough counterspells. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so Stanislav's qualified for this by winning a Pro Tour. Yeah, Pro Tour, uh, Return to Ravnica. Yuya qualified for this by winning this event last year. <laughs> yeah, he would have easily qualified on Pro Points as well. He had a pretty fantastic season. Certainly a guy that, when he becomes eligible, is a strong, strong Hall of Fame candidate. So, Stanislav going for a Snapcaster and getting it spell snared, as we were talking about, but then having the Mana Leak back up. That many lands in play, you don't expect to get mana leaked. Yeah, but you uh, activated a colony and cast a Gideon and a Spell Snare, so you do end up, uh, you know, mana has a way of getting used. Yeah. All right, so we'll see if that Snapcaster has to stare down on an angry Gideon. <laughs> Looks like. Stanislav deciding how many cards he can actually afford to draw, since this game also might come down to decking. Yuya with, it looks like, eight cards in deck, and Stanislav with 12. It looks like he's going to content himself with uh, Cryptic Command. Stanislav picking up a nice Dispel off that Cryptic Command as well. That's another pretty key card here in the mirror. A little a good shot of Stanislav's hand. Yeah, with double spell snare, snapcaster dispel, and uh, the shadow of doubt that's not <laughs> supremely relevant, he, he is in pretty good shape. He, he, he really does that just to make sure he doesn't die to that Gideon. 
You get 11, Stanislav at nine. The last of our four feature matches here in round 11 of 2013 Magic the Gathering World Championship from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. With you uh, trying to resolve Gideon again and you having his own set of counters. He has a Spell Snare, Mana Lake, and a Cryptic Command, all of which, you know, again, have very different uses. But none of Stanislav's cards can stop Gideon on his way back down. There is Colonnade. Coming in for his four points of damage. And it would like to battle. Okay, Shadow of Doubt as basically cycling. Yeah. Though it, one of the players could crack a fetch land this turn. <laughs> Not that that is not likely to happen. Right. So getting his plus, so that Snapcaster is going to have to chip away at it for two, though it, it might have done that anyway. Colony Detects drops Stanislav Sipska to five, so he's now in range of a single Gideon hit. And a Colonnade hit puts him to one, which, even though they, they don't have much burn in their decks post-board, you know, there could be some Electrolyzes floating around since that card is always, always going to be decent. And the, the possibility of getting decked here also very real for Stanislav Sivka. Yeah, I mean, he, he does, even if he ha has access to, like, a Sphinx's Revelation off a Snapcaster Mage, it's still pretty hard to draw a bunch of cards and not get decked, especially even if he is a slightly ahead right now. All right, so what do we got from Stanislav Sipka? Sipka? That's an Electrolyze. Yeah, it looks like he is Electrolyzing to knock a couple counters off Gideon. He's not hes not too close to actually uh, to actually ki killing Yuya, unfortunately, since it looks like... I, I don't know what happened earlier in the game exactly, but it looks like Yuya won the Colonnade fight. He ended up with the last Colonnade standing, <laughs> which is, is a pretty big deal here. <laughs> They're checking libraries twice a turn here just to make sure you don't draw too many cards, which is a funny problem to have. The fetch lands they have in play also might be going dead pretty soon here. They might, there might not just not be fetchable lands left. All right, Yuya untaps, needs both hands to do so. <laughs> yeah, he's got uh, quite, uh, quite a few lands in play. And draws a mana leak. Like, uh, I think I want to attack with Gideon. He's considering it. I mean, the Colonnade is likely to want to march in there as well. He's got... The, the second Mana Leak, it's actually not that bad. The card does combine well in the late game. Since even if one's dead, two, you know, is not always dead, and three is almost rarely ever dead, because you can just use them all at the same time. What are the potential landmines here for you, yeah? Um, he has to worry a little bit about uh, Stanislav... You know, assembling maybe, a, I don't know how many Snapcasters he's gone through, but a Snapcaster into an Electrolyze and untap and attacking with a bunch of them, especially if Yuya does attack with the Gideon, which he's most likely going to want to do. Since uh, it is pretty tough to justify not doing so, but right. it does open you up slightly to a um, kind of all-out attack. So Sifka has attempted to Electrolyze, and Yuya has responded with Mana Leak, you see up there on your screen. Now... Stan is counting things in Yuya's graveyard. He's probably yeah. seeing what he has. I mean, they both what he's already spent. They both have the you know have they both know each other's list both from decklist and the fact they tested together. So you can actually look at their graveyard and try to figure out how many cards they have left of every particular type. Okay, I think I'll pay the three. He says, and Yuya says, "Hey, let's do it again." For which Stan has. Spell, spell snare, and then spell Yuya snare. has cryptic command, and that ends the game because that let, lets the Gideon come through. Because he counters it, bounces the blocking or, yeah. Snapcaster Mage. <laughs> yeah, he just taps the Snapcaster Mage because I think that was all happening before blocks there. Yes. So. All right, like Yuya Watanabe takes down Stanislav Sivka, two games to one. Back here in the booth, I'm Sheldon Mennery. This is Louis Scott Vargas, and we've watched... Man, that was a long round of really awesome magic. Yeah, I mean, the fact that uh, a lot of the players chose to come with blue at red control does make it th so that the rounds tend to be on the long side. Brian Kibler falling to Ben Stark there in the, in the front table match. 
that's a pretty good matchup for, for the control deck anyway. Yeah, I, I do like Ben's side of it a lot more. I think the fact that he's got Hallowed Burials and Cryptic Commands as kind of like global resets, uh -huh. and then a lot of spot removal, and then a Sphinx's Revelation does put him in a pretty good spot. Kibler's not playing a deck that has Thoughtseize, so, unlike Jund, so he's not pressured as much. Right. So that's the wrap for round 11. Luis and I will be back to cover round 12, the final and deciding round. Right now, over to the news desk. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the news desk. 11 rounds have gone. One round remains. But while people are playing for pro points, for honor, for position, for next year, for platinum next year, what they are not playing for any longer is a place in the top four of the 2013 Magic the Gathering World Championship, because that top four has just been decided. Brian David Marshall, who are the four semi-finalists for the World Championship? So leading the field, first to nine wins, nine, nine and two with one round to go, is Reed Duke. Reed is in a position to completely reverse his record from last year's event. He's going for 50-50 <laughs> lifetime. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, he's going for better than 50-50 lifetime. He'd, he'd like to play, you know, he's going to play two more rounds on Sunday. That's his hope for sure. Uh, uh, first to eight was Shahar, Shahar Shanhar. The Israeli national champion. Three-time three -time Grand Prix champion. Uh, someone who has a, a Pro Tour top 16 on his resume this mm -hmm. past year and who just was in the running for player of the year in that mm -hmm. last event. So and he is going to be very busy because he's in the World Magic Cup Friday, Saturday, right, yeah, before he comes back he, on Sunday. He is now officially playing five days of Magic. Absolutely. So that's the first two. Who's next? We just saw Ben Stark eliminate Brian Kibler with his win. He goes to eight wins. He's 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 essentially second to eight. I don't think anyone else mm -hmm. uh, is gonna yep. is gonna no. get there. So Ben Stark is your third player into the Hall of Fame this year and into the top four of Worlds. That leaves one slot open, and it's all about the race on tie breaks. So who can be the first to the next level? And that next level is seven points, and we seven see... Seven wins. Yeah. Seven wins, I should say, yes. And regardless, win, lose, or, well, there's not really going to be a draw, uh, Josh Utter Layton, the player of the year, has seven wins. No one else, although several other players can get to seven wins next round, they will, do they will not round. have better tiebreakers than yeah. Josh if he loses this yeah, round. Because he can win and just make yeah. it moot. Because Josh got there first. He reached what turned out to be the fourth place finish line first. Now, you, you, you made a point earlier mm -hmm. when we, we start talking about this, that players are still playing for that extra pro point. Each, each win represents a pro point. Mm -hmm. I believe you, I wasn't at last year's event, yeah. but you have a story that illustrates the importance of that very specific match, regardless of record, going into the last round. Yeah, deep in day two last year, um, I had a chat with Reed, uh, and obviously he was not a happy man, why would he be? And I just sort of gently said, look, you are one of almost no one on earth who in the next two hours can generate pro points. And if you can go in the next three rounds of, quote, meaningless magic, if you can go two and one, who knows, maybe weeks and months down the line, there will be another match, which means the world to you, where this next two hours becomes the most important match, matches of magic you play in your life. And he went, yeah, hadn't really thought of it like that, and squared his shoulders, got some pro points, and as we saw at the end of the last season, squeaked into platinum ne needed every and, single last point yeah. to get to platinum yeah. to get to the world uh, to the world championship and now is standing on the brink yeah. of 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 you know becoming only the second player to be a magic online champion and a world champion this event last year was literally life changing for Reed Duke and maybe this year will be as well even even in last place so just yeah. just something to, you know should you be thinking that these matches don't matter coming up <laughs> they, they absolutely really matter so Reed Duke Shahar Shenhar Ben 
Stark and Josh Utterlayton, your top four. Well, one of the ways that Reed Duke got to the top four was with his modern deck featuring all kinds of nonsense cards. Bant Hexproof, this deck is full of the lowest quality cards I've seen in a <laughs> successful deck in many a long, long year. But it's great. And you're going to hear all about it over at the video wall with BDM and Reed Duke. Let's take it over there. <laughs> 